Hello and welcome to Data Research Labs. For today's SQL Server Management Tip, we're going to discuss four system store procedures that are commonly used for troubleshooting, what they are, and why you should know how to use them. Also, a quick note, all this material is Creative Commons licensed, free for you to share and reuse within your school or company, and I've placed this presentation as a PDF out on our GitHub site and a link to it below in the YouTube description. First up, what are the top four system store procedures for troubleshooting? Well, first up is SP Server Info, and over to the right you see a dump of what it'll list out, a bunch of attribute names and values that are important for the server. And then there's SP Help, Space, and the object name. Over to the right you see that it'll dump out a whole bunch of details specific to the object, very useful when you're researching a new schema. And then there's SP Monitor. Over to the right you see that it'll take the last time SP Monitor was run, plus the current run, give you a delta in seconds, and then list out a bunch of information on whether the CPU is busy, the I.O. is busy, etc. during that time frame that you're monitoring. And finally, my favorite, SP Who 2 which is used to look at the given SQL process IDs, the SPIDs over on the left, and tells you whether they're sleeping or running or suspended. And then there's Block By column right here, very useful because you can determine whether there's blocking or deadlocking going on. You can determine what login, what server, what program is running certain things. Very useful when you're trying to troubleshoot performance issues and see what's going on. It's a great starting point. Next up, how to use SP Server Info to troubleshoot version, case, and isolation level. Starting from SQL Server Management Studio, Windows button, SQL Server Management Studio, we execute SP Server Info from the query window. So a definition for SP Server Info is best summed up by SQL Knowledge Bank down below in the orange. It's a system store procedure which returns attribute names and values. Starting from SQL Server Management Studio, Windows button, SQL Server Management Studio, we execute SP Server Info from the query window. And then we analyze the results that pop up down below in the grid for three different important attributes. The first of which is the DBMS version. And it'll look something like Microsoft SQL Server 2017-14.0. Some big version number. And so you want to make note of that version number. And why you might use that, an example would be, let's say you're using the new SQL 2016 string aggregate function. And it's going to save you a lot of time, so you use it in your development environment, development server, but then you go to propagate it to stage and prod and it fails. Well, why? Because stage and prod aren't on the latest version of SQL Server, but dev is. So you can save yourself a lot of hassle by running SP Server Info on all environments and then making sure that they're all on the same version of SQL Server. Identifier case is a second attribute that's important to look at. The values that are possible are mixed or sensitive. And where you might run into a problem is you have SQL that's running fine in dev, but then in stage or prod, it's not. And you're wondering why. Why does this where clause in my SQL select work fine in dev, but it finds nothing in stage or prod? Well, then you go in and look and find out that, oh, I have mixed case, upper and lower doesn't matter when you're searching on a where clause on one server, say dev, but stage and prod are sensitive. So then your SQL's not going to work. You're going to have to add a two upper in it, etc. So uh, having the identifier case the same across all environments is important. And if they're not, you can run into strange behavior that's hard to troubleshoot. So definitely look at SP server info and identifier case. And finally, the attribute TX isolation. That shouldn't be altered. That should just be left alone. The default's two, no dirty reads. There might be reasons, if you know what you're doing, that you change it, but I can't imagine why. And what you would really want to look out for is across all your environments, dev, test, stage, prod, make sure that the TX isolation is the same. Otherwise, you'll get totally different behavior with deadlocking and blocking and wonder why this environment's working fine, but that environment's not. So if you have run into that situation where one environment's got a lot of locking issues and another one doesn't, go look at SP Server Info and see if anyone monkeyed around and change these uh, TX isolation settings. And a quick note, there are many other server properties or attributes that exist, and you can go through and look, and some of them may be important to you, especially when comparing across environments. Next up, how to use SP Help to troubleshoot specific object details. So what's a good definition for SP Help? Probably an orange down there from Wiseau. 
to get help on a table, procedure, or column. So how do we use SP Help for troubleshooting and researching objects? Well, starting from SQL Server Management Studio, we go to the query window over there to the right, and we just issue an SP underscore help, single quote, name of the object, and single quote. And the particular object we're going to demo here is a standard SQL system table. So once we've run SP help with the name of the system table, then our results pane will populate a bunch of different sections of details specific to the table or view or store procedure, whatever object that we've asked for help on. And these details are all different. So what we're looking for is, or we're looking at here is the details behind a table. And the first section is this object, the table name, the owner, DBO, etc. The next section is all the column details for that table. The section below that is if there had been an identity column, details behind that identity column. See how it increments, etc. And so on. So there's row GUID ID, the file group information. And this is nice. All the indexes for that table are listed out. So the name of the index, the description, and the index keys that are involved in that particular index. And this is nice because if you don't do this, if you go over to the SQL Server Management Studio and the tree control and you right click and expand the table and right click and expand the indexes on the table and then script each one out individually, it takes time. So with this command, really easy, you get everything dumped in one spot. So you can walk through all the indexes and quickly look through if there's three or four keys, you can see them all labeled out, listed out nice and conveniently. And finally, the foreign key references. This is really nice. So this is telling me that there's some other system tables that have foreign keys into this particular system table. So it'll show you the dependencies. It's very nice. So the bottom line is there's a lot of information all in one place. And if you're looking at a brand new schema for the first time and walking through it, on the tree control on the left in Management Studio, then on the right in the query window, you could be executing SP help this table, SP help that table, and you could be walking through and learning the, the schema quicker that way. So next up, how to use SP monitor to troubleshoot server status. So here's some definitions for the SP monitor store procedure, and you can read them, but in orange are the kind of the key concepts. SP monitor displays current values, and how they've changed since the last time the procedure was run, and it looks at various counters. So how do you use SP Monitor? Well, starting from SQL Server Management Studio, in the query window, you execute SP Monitor. And when you do so, you might get this red error, Procedure SP Monitor, Arithmetic Overflow. If that happens, don't worry about it. All that means is that the last time SP Monitor was run was so long ago, that the number of seconds is greater than what an integer can handle. So if you get the error, just run it again, no big deal. So once that's out of the way, you execute SP Monitor, wait 30 seconds, 60 seconds, whatever, some interval, and then execute it again. And then analyze the results. And you will see that there's a delta between runs. So I last ran it at this given time and then Theoretically, 30 seconds later, I ran it at this time, but it wasn't. It was 9,000 seconds. 600 seconds is 10 minutes. That's a lot of time between runs. So anyway, last time it was run, current time it was run, and then it's going to give you whether or not the CPU and I.O. have been busy during that time delta. 7% CPU busy, I.O. busy. The test server is not doing much. I don't understand the 379%. I wonder if it's you know four CPUs or something and it goes up to 400%. I don't know, that's odd. But these are giving us whether or not it's busy. And if you do a tight time, you can baseline your own system by running SP Monitor with a 30 second gap and just see what normal is for all these values. And then when times are busy, go see what the values are. And the third section, packets received or sent, and the fourth section, total reads rights. And there is an error count. So, you know, if you're having hard disk issues or something's going bad, I would expect this to always be zero. If it's not zero, <laughs> then it might be an indicator of something's going bad, network card or something, hard drive. So, and finally, my favorite, 
that I use all the time, how to use SPHU2 to troubleshoot deadlocks. So what are some definitions for SPHU2, that store procedure? Well, it's undocumented and has been around forever since version 6.5 of SQL Server in the 1990s, but it's widely used instead of SPHU, and it's used to list the processes that are currently active. And as the DBA diaries say, SPHU2 should be a part of every DBA's troubleshooting toolbox. It's really a great it's a store procedure. It's my favorite system store procedure. I use it all the time for looking into deadlocking and blocking. So how do you use SPHU2 for troubleshooting? Well, you fire up SQL Server Management Studio, go to the query window, and type in SP underscore Who2 and hit enter. And it'll pop up a grid with all of the session information displayed for the active sessions that are currently open. So a grid of results comes up, but how do we analyze those? Well, we're going to start by all the output columns that are in that grid. What are they? Which ones are useful? Which ones not so much? Well, here they are. There's a SPID, a SQL session ID. It's very important. That's the handle for the given row and, and session. We have a status, and we're going to come back and circle around and show a list of what all those possible status values are but the process status is important. The login is very important for the session so you know whose tasks you're looking at. The host name is very important because it tells you the host or computer or server name that the login is connected to and from which the session is running. Block by is very, very important. Uh, usually it's blank, meaning there's no blocking or deadlocking, but if there's blocking going on, you'll see the session ID for the other task or other session that's blocking the session you're looking at. And if there's deadlocking, they'll each be blocking themselves. And we'll look at what that looks like in a minute. Uh, the database name, very useful. So you can fill, well, you can look at which databases the particular session is associated with. I don't so much look at the command because it's only a portion of the T-SQL command. Sometimes it's useful, but there's other ways to get at the full SQL command. So I typically don't look at that. CPU time, disk I.O. time, I typically don't look at that. That's the total time since the session was open or the total I.O. And then the last batch, last time a batch request was run by a session, I usually don't look at that, but you could. Program name, very important. I look at that a lot. The software application that's running the given session on the given host name. So program name can be real handy. And here's the session ID repeated again. I don't know why they do that. Maybe it's so they have one on the left and one on the right side of the grid. And request ID, I don't really use that either. Circling back around to the process status values here in this table, green is good, no impact. Black means it's busy running. And all the red statuses mean maybe there's something up. So if you see a background status, that just means that there's most likely the SA account or user is running some system background task. And usually these are SPIDs 1 through 50, so I just ignore SPIDs 1 through 50 usually. Uh, sleeping statuses are typically users who their connection is open, but they haven't run anything for 30 minutes, an hour, or two hours, and so you have a bunch of sleeping connections laying around. As long as you don't have thousands and thousands of them, it's probably no big deal. The running session, it's busy running one or more batches. And then now we get to the red ones that are kind of interesting. If you have any suspended sessions, that means the session's waiting for an event, typically an I.O. event, to complete or a temp DB operation to finish. And if it's just three or four or five seconds to run SBHU2, it's suspended, a given session ID. You run it again and it's not suspended, I wouldn't worry about it. But if it's 30, 60 seconds or more and it's suspended frequently or for a long time, then you might go look at perfmon on the server and see if the hard drive's busy. Rollbacks, uh, if that status, I typically don't pay any attention to that, except once in a while, dev test stage. If I'm in the middle 30 minutes down into a big batch process and I realize, oh no, and I stop it, now it's got to roll back the transaction. So I can watch that and keep running SBHU2 to see how long it's going to stay in rollback mode. Runnable, interesting, I've seen that occasionally. A task when it's runnable on a busy server, it means that it's in the queue of a scheduler and it's waiting to get a, I should have put quotes around that, time quantum. So it's just a busy server, it's gonna get picked up and run, it's just waiting. Spin loop, I've never seen that, but it's a session task is waiting for a spin lock to free up. 
Dormant, never seen that, but that means the session is being reset. And pending, I don't think I've seen that. It means the session is waiting for a worker thread to free up. So some of these are probably, they're just briefly there and then they disappear. Oh, and a quick note, these presentations are all Creative Commons licensing, so feel free to copy them and use them in your organization or your school or whatever. Uh, you can take a screenshot of this one if you want. Pause it, take a screenshot, or I've put all the slides, put this slide online on my GitHub account, and I will put a link to that in the YouTube description down below. So before we get started, just a quick level set. This is what the output of SP Who 2 looks like. You have the SPID, you have the status. I've blurred out the login and the host name. You have a block by column that's really important. You have the database name, command, etc., and it goes off to the right. There's a bunch of useful columns all laid out. So now that we've established that, let's look at one of the most useful things that I use SP Who 2 for, and that's to identify blocking and deadlocking, which is bad. So I start by looking for a status of suspended on any of the given rows. When I find suspended, I immediately go over to the block by column. I mean, there's other reasons it may be suspended beyond blocking and deadlocking. But if it's blocking and deadlocking, I'll know because it'll be suspended and it'll have a block by value. And I walk back up through the block bys until I find the parent process. So I start suspended. By what? By process, by SPID 73. Okay, I go to SPID 73. It's suspended. By what? By SPID 67. So I go up to SPID 67. It's running, so it's not blocked, and it has no block by. So this is my root cause that's blocking these two. Now, if I had deadlocking, this would also say suspended. This would not be blank. It would point back down to one of these, 73 or 74. And you get in a circle, a never-ending loop where one is blocking this and this is blocking that. And long story, I'm not going to get into it, but that's really bad. I've seen it go thousands of seconds, which is hours and hours, where processes are deadlocked and they aren't going to win. And those are critical to identify and not only fix the symptom by coming in here and killing the task, but you need to go look at the host, the login, and the program, figure out what program was running, and go identify why is that program deadlocking with something else. you got to fix it up the root cause up in the source code. But uh, that's how you use SP Who 2 to identify blocking where there's a clear pattern up to a root or deadlocking where the block buys point at each other. So next up we're going to see how do we fix that. And by fix that I mean the symptom. We're not going to address fixing the root cause which could be many different reasons up in the source code. So if in your dev test and stage environment, don't do this in prod, Leave it to the DBAs to do this in prod. But if it's environments you own, dev test stage, what I'd recommend after identifying blocking or deadlocking is wait 20 seconds, wait 60 seconds, retry SP Who 2. See if it cleared itself. If it did, you just have a busy server and some processes are blocking other processes because maybe this process is doing a select and this process is doing a update and this process is doing an insert. And you gotta wait for the insert to complete and you gotta wait for the update to complete and then the select can run. So it's not a big deal, give it some time. It's when you get three, four, or five minutes or you have blocking just all the time. Every time you hit SP Who 2, something's blocked. That's when you start to dig in and, and go do some more research. But for this particular issue, we're thinking about or trying to resolve a symptom where you have some process blocked for one or two or three minutes. And once you've established that by running SP Who 2 two minutes later and still blocked, You'll know who the owner is because you have the login, so you can ping the owner and say, hey, I noticed you have a process running. It's blocking some other processes. Can I kill it? And if they say yes, then you just go into SM, uh, SQL Server Management Studio in the query and you issue a kill space and the proc ID. So 67 was our root cause in this little mocked up SP Who 2 output. So we just kill 67, spit 67, and bam. Once that's out of the way, 73 and 74 will clear up and run and do their work. A second thing to look for when you run SP Who 2 output is uh, for parallel processes, which are bad. And the indicator that you'll see is the same SPID process ID repeating over and over inside SP Who 2. And SQL Server does that when they when it determines that a query is going to run long, so it splits the process across multiple threads. And if that's happening frequently, that's devastating to performance, especially the I.O. Uh, to fix that, you can 
raise the query threshold for parallelism or turn down max stop. You can Google both of those. And also I'll put some links to information I found on the web about parallel processing and what to look for. I'll put that in the YouTube description. Expand the description below this video and then click the link. And finally, a third thing to look for with SP who 2 output is high CPU time or high disk I.O. And it's difficult and awkward to read these because the CPU time and, and disk I.O. is um, relative to when the session started. So maybe the session was fine and then the last five minutes had a problem. It's going to be tough to tell. So instead what I did is wrote down, well, you could theoretically run SP who 2 look at the session you're interested in, write down the numbers, wait 30 seconds, run SP who 2 again, write down the numbers, and that way you could calculate your own delta. Yeah, you could do that, but I don't know. The one thing I did read that's a good signature pattern to look for is if the CPU time is high and the disk I.O. is zero, that indicates a bad execution plan. So that's one thing you could look for. Thank you for watching, and please, if you found this video helpful, click like, or even better, click subscribe to increase this channel's reach.